Thanks, Perkin, for the invitation. Um, yeah, the invitation, it came through our communications department uh, back in April, and obviously it was a time of intense debate within and outside Google about the military application of AI. And uh, since then, there have been some significant developments, obviously, from your side, Google's AI principles, but also at the international level, which I'll touch on, governments increasingly recognizing the need to retain human control over weapons and decisions on the use of force. So it's a pleasure to be here. I think it's actually a critical time for uh, discussion on this issue. Militaries are heavily invested in development of robotic uh, and digital technologies, including the software that underpins both, and increasingly, of course, AI and machine learning. I think it's also critical that technology developers and the tech industry involved in the conversations that are going on, both at national level and international level. Now, I want to be totally clear at the outset, I'm not going to solve any of your personal or collective ethical dilemmas, and I would never claim to or try to. But what I can do is explain a little bit how the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, approaches the issues of new technologies of warfare. And um, so before I get into that, I'm actually just going to say a bit more about the bigger picture. So I'm going to actually be, talk a bit more broadly than AI and ethics. I'm going to talk about conflict. I'm going to talk about the role of the, the ICRC. I'm going to talk about new technologies. And then I'll get into the implications, because I think it's important to, to understand the bigger picture. So first of all, quickly, what is the International Committee of the Red Cross? For those who don't know, we're a neutral, independent and impartial humanitarian organisation. So we work to assist and protect victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence around the world. Victims by victims, predominantly civilians, but also combatants, fighters who are injured or detained in armed conflict. So we're an international organisation, so we have status as an international organisation, uh, but we don't have any government membership or participation, so we're independent. Our mandate comes from the Geneva Conventions, uh, international humanitarian law, the rules of war, which are essentially the basis for all our work, and I'll get a bit more into that later. Quickly, this is where we work. Wherever there's armed conflict, you'll find us. Um, we're in about 87 countries, over 14,500 staff. Um, predominantly, like I say, where there's armed conflict, but we're also in capitals around the world for humanitarian diplomacy and preventive work, um, working with governments and others. There should be probably a small dot, red dot. I don't know if I have a red dot on here, but I do. Somewhere out there in Silicon Valley, there's now someone this year who's working out of our Washington office to engage with, uh, with tech companies in Silicon Valley. Um, this is a, uh, like a funding slide, but the point is not the funding. It's to just to illustrate where our major field operations are. So these are our 10 biggest operations uh, this year, uh, as you can see where there are the major conflicts taking place or major post-conflict post countries. Funding, that slide has disappeared, but essentially the largest portion of that graph is governments. Governments are predominant funding. The, 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 the second largest slice is the European Commission, but we're increasingly looking to, to improve funding from private donors. So what do we do? Just very briefly, one of our major areas of work is protection. So we work to protect those affected by armed conflict, whether it's by collecting information on how conflicts are, are conducted and raising concerns that we have with the authorities uh, who and those parties to the conflict. It could be visiting detainees. It could be helping to restore family links between those who have been separated during the conflict. So that's protection. There's also assistance. And this is both emergency humanitarian assistance, but also, I would say, more long-term capacity building for essential services, whether it's water and habitation, whether it's medical care and medical services. Uh, or whether it's things like risk awareness. This slide on the uh, picture on the right is uh, risk awareness for the civilian population about the risk of unexploded munitions. 
the other major aspect of work is prevention. Uh, and this really is about long-term dialogue with weapon bearers, those who carry weapons, militaries and others, the political and military authorities and civil society. Uh, that's a long-term work, like I say, to promote uh, and uphold the rules of, the rules of law. Um, the rules of war, sorry. The rules of law. Um, and to carry out humanitarian diplomacy, basically in support, of, uh, in support of our humanitarian work. A picture on the right is taken from our desk a few weeks ago in The Hague at the meeting of the Chemical Weapons Convention. So rather than try and explain to you uh, the rules of war in a rather sort of roundabout fashion, I'm going to use this short video. Since the beginning, humans have resorted to violence as a way to settle disagreements. Yet through the ages, people from around the world have tried to limit the brutality of war. It was this humanitarian spirit that led to the first Geneva Convention of 1864 and to the birth of modern international humanitarian law. Setting the basic limits on how wars can be fought, these universal laws of war protect those not fighting, as well as those no longer able to. To do this, a distinction must always be made between who or what may be attacked and who or what must be spared and protected. Most importantly, civilians can never be targeted. To do so is a war crime. into our village. They shouted that they were going to kill everyone. I was so scared. I ran to hide in the bush. I heard my mother screaming. I thought I would never see her again. Every possible care must be taken to avoid harming civilians or destroying things essential for their survival. they have a right to receive the help they need. The conditions prisoners lived in never used to bother me. People like him were the reason my brother was dead. He was the enemy and was nothing to me. But then I realized that behind bars, he was out of action and no longer a threat to me and my family. The laws of war prohibit torture and other ill treatment of detainees, whatever their past. They must be given food and water and allowed to communicate with loved ones. This preserves their dignity and keeps them alive. Medical workers save lives, sometimes in the most dangerous conditions. Fighters from both sides were wounded in a deadly battle. We were taking them to the nearest hospital. At a checkpoint, a soldier threatened us to treat his men only. We were running out of time, and I was afraid that now all of them were going to die. Medical workers must always be allowed to do their job and the Red Cross or Red Crescent must not be attacked. The sick or wounded have a right to be cared for, regardless of whose side they are on. Advances in weapons technology have meant that the rules of war have also had to adapt. Because some weapons and methods of warfare don't distinguish between fighters and civilians, limits on their use have been agreed. In the future, wars may be fought with fully autonomous robots. But will such robots ever have the ability to distinguish between a military target and someone who must never be attacked? Uh. 
no matter how sophisticated weapons become, it is essential that they are in line with the rules of war. International humanitarian law is all about making choices that preserve a minimum of human dignity in times of war and make sure that living together again is possible once the last bullet has been shot. So yeah, it's all about limits, international humanitarian law, the rules of war. So it doesn't say anything about whether or not a war starts, whether it ends. It's about the, the conduct, essentially, and it aims to limit the consequences. As mentioned in the video, weapons uh, have particular consequences, and the ICRC has worked on weapons issues for over 150 years. Um, our two core, I guess, raison d'etre in that area, our core areas of work are to look at the humanitarian consequences, what we see in armed conflict, and interlinked, their compliance with the rules of war. And that includes considering whether new rules might be needed. As in the past, we've, caused, uh, we've called for new rules on chemical weapons, banning them, uh, banning blinding laser weapons, banning landmines, banning cluster munitions, um, rules to regulate the arms trade. Even last year, over 120 governments agreed a treaty to ban nuclear weapons. And all of this, our contribution to this, is based on either the real or uh, perceived potential humanitarian consequences. Now, uh, in today's conflicts, this is really what kills most civilians. It's heavy explosive weapons in towns and cities, and it's arms trade transferring weapons to those who aren't using them in compliance with the law. So this is something we're also working on, of course. But we also try to look ahead and look at how new technologies are changing conflict, uh, to look at what the consequences in humanitarian terms may be, and to look at what the legal issues might be, look at the compatibility with existing law. This is a, a meeting we held a few weeks ago on the humanitarian consequences of cyber weapons, looking at potential risks for healthcare, for essential civilian services, in the, even the internet uh, core structure. Now, I would say our focus over the last uh, 15 years has been predominantly, as you would expect, on increasingly autonomous robotic systems, uh, on cyber weapons and warfare, and now increasingly on the software that underpins both. For us, um, I should say we're not anti-technology, it should be clear we're not anti-technology. So it can be that military technology, even in weapon systems, can help with compliance with the rules. So a precision guided bomb that uses a laser or a GPS signal to precisely land on a target, legitimate target, can offer better compliance with the rules. And the, the necessity to distinguish between civilians that you can't be targeted and legitimate military targets. But that technology in itself is not inherently good for civilians. Because if that bomb is precisely on a hospital or precisely on your house, then it doesn't matter that that technology is precise. It's also the way it's used. So this is obvious, really, but it's sometimes lost. And it's an important point. You have to look at the weapons technology and also the way it's used. Now, this slide is in South Lebanon, um, 2007. And um, it shows a orchard contaminated with cluster munitions. Now, cluster munitions have been around for a long time before they were prohibited in 2008. Designed for things like destroying a military runway, loads of munitions spread all over. Um, but that's not how they're always used. If they're um, deployed around villages where people are living and working, and if they land in trees, then in this case, they hang down like Christmas decorations. As you can see, they have a little tether on. And when someone comes into that orchard, that'll take your arm off or kill you. So the point is, is that you may claim the, the reliability, the effectiveness, the safety of a certain technology, but it can't be an abstract claim. It has to be in the real world, in the context in which it's used. And that's something we keep in mind as we look at new technologies. 
So, of course, everyone has in their mind the idea of what an autonomous weapon is. My favourite nightmare, if I can put it that way, at the moment is from Black Mirror, the episode Metalhead. I don't know if you've seen it, recommend it. Um, and maybe we'll get there. I hope not, but maybe we will. But um, the fact is, um, autonomous weapons already exist, albeit in a limited form, and they don't look anything like Black Mirror or the Terminator. The way the ICRC defines them, an autonomous weapon, is one that can select and attack targets without hum human intervention. So it's the machine, based on its sensors and then its programming, that is triggered by its environment and self-initiates an attack. So it's a clear distinction between a remote-controlled or a directly human-controlled weapon. But critically, it's not to do with the sophistication of the technology. It doesn't matter if it's got quite simple programming or very advanced AI. It's the lack of human involvement in its triggering. So I would say if there was one thing to think about when I think about autonomous weapons, the first thing to think about is unpredictability. So by definition, a robot, a machine triggered by its environment in a complex environment, you have some level of unpredictability about when it's going to fire, what it's going to fire against, uh, and where it's going to fire even. And that depends a bit the nature of the system. But there is already inherent unpredictability. Uh, I think that's important to remember as we, as we move on through this discussion. So today, what do we have? This is a report from Stockholm International Peace Research Institute from last year. Um, most autonomous weapons today, uh, they're quite constrained. They mostly attack objects. They're mostly designed to attack objects. And in fact, the vast majority are air defense systems. Uh, there are some, and I'll get to it in a minute, some which uh, have some degree of autonomy that search for targets over a wide area. And there are some anti-personnel systems which have a degree of autonomy in targeting, although they don't quite fit the definition of being autonomous yet. Um, I would say it's important to, to say that, like I say, they're constrained. Most of them target objects. They're mostly used in areas where there aren't many civilians. They're mostly uh, constrained in time that they operate autonomously. They're mostly constrained in space that they operate autonomously. And critically, they're mostly human supervised. Often the human can intervene and deactivate even before uh, the weapon system carries out its uh, attack. So air defense systems, like I mentioned, on ships, but also on military installations on land. Uh, they detect incoming missiles, rockets. Even some of these systems that detect incoming rockets, they have, at the moment, the ability for a human soldier to verify. So the machine says a rocket coming. It's very simple. This is not like advanced AI. This is trajectory and speed. If it fits in the trajectory and speed, if it's coming to you within this speed, then it fires. Uh, so they check it if they have time. And they do have time, even for an incoming rocket. The missiles, they don't. It's going too fast. And that's one of the drivers for autonomy in general, is speed, from a military perspective. Loitering munitions. Most of these are remote controlled so far, all sh different shapes and sizes, but some of them are autonomous already. Um, there's one which searches for radars and can search for up to nine hours over hundreds of kilometers for a radar system. That uses a very simple technical signature electromagnetic signature of a radar. But you don't know where it's going to land over the next nine hours. You don't know when, actually. You don't even know what it's going to hit or what next to that radar. This is, it illustrates the issues with autonomy. This is the only type of system, I would, that as far as I'm aware, that's deployed, that is directed specifically at humans. Obviously, you can have humans inside objects, like aircraft but specifically at humans targeting. You find these in a handful of countries at borders, uh, at perimeters. Now, so far, as far as is understood, these things can identify human targets automatically. They use human shapes, heat signatures. Again, I don't think it's particularly sophisticated. But then they send a signal back to the human operator who then decides whether it can fire. But of course, you don't even have to change the software for that to be autonomous. And actually, the, the manufacturers 
already say this could be fully autonomous. The user so far doesn't put it in that mode or decides to have it set up differently. So the uh, point is, this is a current issue. This is not a far future issue. That's been around for at least 10 years. Um, the other thing to remember about autonomy and weapons is that it's not about specific categories of killer robots, all right? It's a function. It's a function that could be applied to any weapon system. And that's really important to remember when you're thinking about the implications, but also thinking about how to address the implications. Uh, no, militaries, uh, and naturally for them, they're investing heavily in robotic systems, uh, armed and unarmed. Air, land and sea of all different shapes and sizes. This is a, a capture from a video explainer we did with Vox Media in the US. There's an infinite range of the types of systems that could emerge. They could be remote controlled, they could be autonomous. It's a function. Obviously, you know, as everyone's well aware, I mean, you can buy one of these type of small drones in your local uh, FNAC or electri electrical shop. Uh, FNAC being, I don't know if you have FNAC in Zurich, probably not. What's your local electrical shop in Zurich? Media Mart. Media Mart. We have that in Geneva too. So, yes, um, this was, I was at a conference and the, the, the company selling this was saying, well, you know, we could use this, we could put some grams of explosive on it, it could be sent off to kill people autonomously. Um, I mean, there's, that aside, there's already a lot of investment in small drones and, of course, in swarms of drones. And there's a question about where the human role will be in that. In swarms, for example, there's a massive incentive for autonomy because how do you control 500 small drones at, one, at the same time? Um, remote control small drones are already being used by... Uh, by non-state armed groups in Syria, Iraq, Ukraine. Yeah, it, w it was on the newspaper. ISIS uses a swarm of drones against the Russians, and the Russians did not have defense against them. Yeah, so it's a serious question. I mean, the question is, for all of these systems, where what's the human role? Where, I mean, to what degree will there be autonomy in the targeting? And that's what uh, ICRC is focused on. Yes, flying, navigating, driving, OK, fine. But what's the really important point? The, point? the important point is the targeting. And that's what's important from a legal perspective and also an ethical perspective. Now, I would never come here to lecture you about software. You'll know far more about it than me. But just to say that, obviously, the central component of these future systems is the software. It is where that software will either be used to directly initiate a weapon, making it an autonomous weapon system, or it may just be used as a decision aid, a decision support system for humans who, who may make then certain decisions. I think there are different issues raised by those. I think they're more acute with the one that directly triggers a weapon, but there are also concerns where these systems are using, uh, being used to inform human decisions. It's not theoretical. And uh, as you're well aware, there's heavy military interest around different parts of the world in military application of AI. And of course, for a wide range of different purposes and decisions and so on. Um, one of them is targeting. Um, what's known in the military is automatic target recognition. And this is just an example, it could have been pulled from anywhere, about efforts to harness advances in AI machine learning, in image recognition, in facial recognition, in behavior recognition, in pattern recognition for targeting. Like I say, it could be directly to trigger a weapon or it could be to, uh, as a decision support aid for, for humans. It could be to identify objects, people, patterns. It could be even to predict, as I'm sure you could tell me better than, the, than I could in terms of software capability nowadays. So there's increasing talk in a conflict situation about algorithmic warfare. Uh, and I think that's a, a, fair, a fair description. So the important point I want to make is that the big picture is this is all about decisions. It's about decisions on the use of force, decisions to kill, injure, and destroy. It's about the relationship between humans and machines in those decisions. 
And yes, for us, the most acute decisions to look at now are decisions on whether someone's killed or whether a building is destroyed. But of course, these could have much wider implications on other decisions in armed conflict, arrest and detention, which type of military operation is carried out, even nuclear posture, strategic decisions. Um, and there are parallels, obviously, with the rest of society. What discussions in other areas, in transport, medicine, finance, criminal justice, perhaps one of the best examples, where decisions affecting human lives already being influenced by algorithmic data-driven systems. Uh, but decisions which have this kind of consequence. So at ICIC, we've been trying to get a handle on how the technology is developing in order to inform a kind of legal and ethical assessment. Uh, and like I say, one of our concerns in general about autonomy is unpredictability. And then we want to learn more about AI and machine learning. And one thing that, at least to, to us, and I'd really be interested to discuss this after, is we see a potential problem of inherent unpredictability with machine learning algorithms. The lack of transparency in how they function, maybe a knowledge of the input and the output, but not what happens in the middle. The questions of bias questions of safety, unknown failures, and, and I critically, changing functioning over time. Imagine a weapon system. Before you introduce a weapon system in armed conflict, you have to decide whether it, you have to test it, you have to decide whether in the circumstances you use it, it's going to be, operate within the law. Well, if it changes its functioning over time, then you can forget it because, you know, you can't assess that. Um, but there, you know, there are, there are these technical questions that, that uh, are really pressing now uh, and urgent. The ICIC's approach, I mean, so what to do about all of this? Uh, our approach is to say we need to keep human control. We need to keep human control over weapon systems and over decisions to use force. This is a, a piece by our president earlier this year when governments were meeting in Geneva to discuss autonomous weapons. And it's not an easy question, actually, what is the required level of human control? Um, but it's a question that needs to be answered, both from a legal and ethical perspective. Because the loss of control has really serious consequences for civilians, for aid workers, for fighters, for soldiers as well. An example my colleague in the field mentions whenever I talk about this issue, he goes, yeah, sentry weapons. How would I negotiate access at a border or a checkpoint with a sentry weapon? So, like I say, there are important both legal and ethical dimensions to this. this on the legal dimension, there's been a serious misconception um, over many years, this idea of machines applying the law, somehow inanimate objects with legal agency. I don't know where it came from. At least from ICRC's perspective, we've been crystal clear that the rules of war, they apply to humans, they're applied by humans. Machines may carry out functions with different degrees of automation, but ultimately human judgments are required to comply with those laws. And that means, actually, the law already limits the degree of autonomy that is acceptable. Because, to explain this a bit more, um, when human soldiers, fighters, are carrying out attacks, they need to distinguish between civilians and combatants in that specific circumstance, not in general, there, now. They need to make a judgment of whether their attack they're going to make, the risk it, makes, uh, the risk it causes to civilians, is proportionate. So, they may attack a legitimate military target, creates risk for civilians. Is that proportionate? They need to make that judgment now, then, not in general. They also need to take precautions. So should the situation change over time, they need to cancel it. They might need to stop it. So they're contextual. They need to be there. So this means there needs to be a human involvement, um, and it means limits on autonomy from a legal perspective. But of course, there's also the ethical issue. I mean, I know this is something 
you've been grappling with in a, probably a, a different sense. But, and again, it's, it's across society. It's, this, it's the role of humans and the relationship with machines in decisions that affect people's lives. And, of course, these ones are the most significant types of decisions. Many governments, civil society organisations and, and men, much of the public you know, are adamant. We cannot delegate decisions to kill to machines. Um, but what does that mean? And we need to work out what that means. For us, it means you need to have sufficient human intent to link the intention in the specific context of an attack to the consequences. This is not a generalised decision to be made years in advance. This is, at that point in time, a specific human role in that decision about whether people are attacked, buildings are destroyed. There's also a bit, uh, an issue about um, human agency. This is something the ICRC's strategy at the moment not only talks about human control over the decisions, but human agency. And I think this gets to this idea about human intention. And there's also the question of human dignity. Um, what does it mean? What does it require in terms of that human involvement in those decisions to uphold human dignity? And this is about really... And people can fall in different ways on this in terms of their ethical perspective. Are you purely looking at consequences? Or are you also looking at the process? Are you looking at just if someone was killed? Or are you looking at how they were killed and why? This is an important point about human dignity. So what's our role in all this? This is a picture from the first meeting at the United Nations in Geneva, 2014. And I've, been, I've had the pleasure, I would say, sometimes not so pleasurable, experience of being there for every one of them. Um, in a multilateral sense, especially in the current sort of world that we're living in, um, there's been some progress. But governments are completely divided both on the scope of the problem of autonomous weapons and also what to do about it. So actually the majority of states now want to see new law that would either have a requirement for human control specified or that would um, specify a category of autonomous weapons that you would prohibit. As you might have gathered from this presentation, if you're going to have any kind of regulatory approach, it's going to have to be along the human control element because of what I mentioned about it being a function, not a specific category. Other governments, I would say, want a kind of middle approach where they want to agree some politically binding, not legally binding principles. We'd like to have human control and we think it's, you know, these are some of the key elements. Other governments, some major military powers among them, they said, no, nope, we, we're satisfied with existing rules. We just need to ensure they're implemented. Now, that's on what to do about it. Now, I think one way to, to say, well, to clarify why some kind of international limits are needed. And ICRC has for, for several years been calling for international limits to be agreed. It hasn't said whether they should be new law, politically binding or otherwise, but there needs to be some limits. And one of the reasons is, it's when you ask someone or a different government or a different military or a different person what is sufficient human control, they give you very different answers. Someone will say that means remote control, direct remote control in that circumstance, as for example with many existing armed drones. The other end, someone will say, at some point in time, I programmed this weapon system, so therefore in all future circumstances, it's kind of under my control. Now, for me, that, that shows there's a need to look actually what that, that means in practice. Um, we all, like I said, we already have some weapon systems that have been used lawfully and without some ethical concern that aren't under direct remote control. So perhaps it's not at that end. But then I'm pretty doubtful of it being at that end either. So, there needs to be work to, to, to determine what human control means in practice. 
And this is where we've been pressing governments repeatedly and most recently in November to actually answer this substantive question. Because whatever option you choose, new law, politically binding, whatever, you need to work out this question. What does it mean? Yes, all governments have now agreed on the importance of the human element, human responsibility. But what does it mean in practice? What's required for compliance with the law? What's required for acceptability with our values? And this is a central question that needs to be answered. Now, what's, what's your role as technologists, as working in the tech industry? And far be it for me to suggest what your role is, of course. That's up to you. But I would say that the engagement of technologists and te technology developers and the tech industry is critical in these discussions. Absolutely critical. And it's not just on the technical questions, it's important on the technical questions. So if someone says to me, this weapon system or this type of technology, this AI development, that's going to save civilians, that's going to protect lives, that needs to be interrogated. Someone needs to, of course, it's on the, pers the, the developer who claims that to say, well, to explain how the technology works. But there needs to also be some assessment of, critical assessment of the technology, how it works. Not just the capabilities. I know you're all problem solvers with new technologies, but also the limitations. Actually, I'm more interested in the limitations than I am in the capabilities in some senses. Not, again, because of anti-technology, but because it's important to have a realistic assessment. Because this is not just theoretical, it is already being tested and used. So we need to know what the limits of the technology are. It's not, well, in 20 years, you know, we may, may reach artificial general intelligence. It's more, we're using this machine learning in this system now, what are the limits? So I think it's been encouraging. It's been really encouraging. I would say compared to other areas that I've worked on, particularly biotechnologies and the risks from biolo biological weapons, it's been actually quite difficult to get the engagement of biologists on the dual use risks of their technologies and their research. They say, well, it's not relevant. We're not developing biological weapons. No, it's true. They're developing vaccines or new medicines, or whatever. But there's been a, di there's a difference in the, in the tech industry, I would say at least from my perspective as, a, as an outsider, technologists have been very involved in the discussion. There have been, of course, things like Google's AI principles. Uh, there's been Microsoft's call for a digital peace in cyberspace. There have been their call for regulation of facial recognition. I think someone mentioned to me earlier that also someone at Google have been talking about concerns about facial recognition. There have also been open letters by scientists, by industry CEOs in robotics and AI about autonomous weapons, raising some issues and concerns. So I would suggest respectively, respectfully that it's important that you stay involved and that you get more involved. It could be to work with organizations like ourselves to better understand the technologies. It could be to work with uh, NGOs. Uh, it could be more at... Uh, a company level or industry level in terms of deciding how technologies are applied and looking at the risks uh, that they raise, um, bringing the expertise that you bring. Um, I've been, like I said, I've been at the last five years of discussions at the UN in Geneva and it's predominantly governments and NGOs. There's not many Technologists, there's not many tech companies. I think this is an area where there could be more involvement and it could be really quite beneficial. So, with that, I'll say thank you very much for listening and I'll be pleased to carry on the discussion with you in the time we have available.